Okay, thank you again for attending our first Halloween special on Jinn and Legends, Stories from Palestine. Our speaker today is Ahmed Nabil, who's standing in the back, founder of Palestine's Fiction Council, who has traveled to the U.S. to discuss his work. I'm Professor Ali Khan. I'm the director of the University of Michigan Global Islamic Studies Center, which is your host today, along with the University of Michigan Library. I'll begin by introducing the Global Islamic Studies Center, and then I'll acquaint you with the event and our speaker, and then I'll turn the floor over to him. Uh, but just to remind you, please help yourselves to pastries and tea in the back that was catered by our favorite Yemeni cafe in Ann Arbor, Socotra. <laughs> The University of Michigan Global Islamic Studies Center aims to promote the understanding of global Islamic culture and Muslim societies worldwide, not just the Middle East, but Asia, Africa, and the Americas. We are an academic unit at the University of Michigan, but also a community member in Southeast Michigan. If you are a student, faculty, staff, or community member interested in our events, please join our newsletter and keep up with us on social media. We send out monthly newsletters to so make sure that you subscribe. If you're a Michigan student wanting to get involved with our center, please attend our events. We also have an undergraduate minor and a graduate master's specialization in international and regional studies with an Islamic studies focus. So please consult our website if those are things that interest you. We also have, if you are a U of M student or a faculty member looking for funding for a project or event, our applications are open to undergrad students, grad students, and faculty at every level who are looking for funding for projects that are related to Islam and Muslim societies and communities, including in the United States. We, are, we fund pretty widely, so please make sure you apply, and the deadline is on a rolling basis. On Thursday, November 14th, at the new and soon to open branch of Cups and Chai Cafe in Ann Arbor, we'll be holding another edition of our very popular last year Michigan professor five minute community flash talks, asking professors what's new in Islamic studies. Stay tuned to our website for more information. Today's talk is part of our sixth annual October Halloween Muslim Horror Film Festival in which we explore what horror, the supernatural, and their intersections with politics mean in films and talks by directors and artists from Muslim-majority countries. This year, our films are from Azerbaijan, Egypt, Jordan, Morocco, Pakistan, Palestine, and the United Arab Emirates. We have three more feature films to go, so you have lots of time to go and watch Halloween films. To make, so make sure that you reserve your streaming virtual and in-person tickets. On October 17th, for a week, we'll be streaming the Egyptian film Warda online. On October 24th, a Thursday, we will be screening the Pakistani film In Flames in person at the State Theater. That is the first time that we're bringing a Pakistani film to U of M. On October 31st, otherwise known as Halloween or Halloween, We'll be screening the Emirati film Three and hosting a Q&A with its director and writer also at the State Theater. Please visit our Global Islamic Studies Center website for more info on tickets. All of the films are free to watch for everyone. I'd like to thank our Halloween 2024 co-sponsors. This talk is brought to you by the Global Islamic Studies Center and the University of Michigan Library. I would particularly like to thank Evan Kropf in the back, our librarian for Middle Eastern and North African Studies and Religious Studies, as well as Hannah Matar, the our Islamic Studies Program Specialist. Without them, nothing can happen. Halloween is also co-sponsored by the International Institute, the Department of Afro-American and African Studies, the Department of Film, Television, and Media, the Department of Middle Eastern Studies, the, the African Studies Center, the Center for Middle Eastern and North African Studies, the Center for South Asian Studies, the Center for Russian, Eastern European, and Eurasian Studies, the Digital Islamic Studies Center, and the Institute for Research on Women and Gender. That's a really long list. But just to show you that you know many units on campus support us and support Halloween. I'll now introduce our guest speaker, Ahmed Nabil, and the organization he founded, Palestine's Fiction Council. Ahmed Nabil is a visual artist practitioner and researcher in the fields of Arab and Islamic mythology and paranormal phenomena. 
He focuses on their relationship to land, natural resources, and their integration into intangible heritage for the preservation of land and collective memory. In 2015, he founded the Fiction Council. The Fiction Council is a Palestinian community-based nonprofit organization based in Jerusalem, founded to serve as a creative space for the community, particularly young creatives, to explore and develop their imaginations. The Council's mission is to preserve and promote Palestinian intangible heritage, primarily in the fields of folk tales, superstitions, and ancient legends through all possible creative means. It also, the, the Fiction Council also aims to bridge the gap between the community and their imaginative heritage, recognizing imagination as the Palestinians' ultimate tool for change. The Fiction Council also uses Palestinian folk heritage and stories in conducting trauma workshop for pal workshops for Palestinian women and other people. Ahmad's work and the Fiction Council's work counter the tide of horror and loss that we have seen not just in the last year, but in the last 70 something odd years. So we couldn't be more grateful to him for sharing that work with you. So just briefly, the structure of today's event is part lecture and part, uh, part lecture and talk and part contribution from you, the audience. Ahmed will introduce the Fiction Council and talk about his work for about 40 minutes. He'll open with a few legends, myths, and readings from his book, Hidden Companions, about the documented paranormal encounters from the old city of Jerusalem, and then delve into jinn and other supernatural stories from Palestine. We'll then have a little break for tea and snacks, but also please help yourself throughout the event. Then we'll transition to interactive. In the second half of the event, for which we'll have about 40 minutes, we'll ask you, the audience members, to share your own cultural legends, S supernatural experiences, including gin stories, and anything paranormal that you might want to talk about, especially if they're culturally related. We're really interested to hear them. And of course, you can also ask Ahmed questions about his work and his stories that he collects from Palestine. So thank you, and we hope that you find this talk and discussion illuminating. Ahmed. Thank you, Aliyah. Um, it is such an honor to be standing here before you all. Um, it wasn't a very easy trip back from Jerusalem, uh, coming here to the United States to actually make the, or uh, try to make the Fiction Council um, or attempt to make the Fiction Council more visible to the Palestinians and, and Arabs and, you know, um, uh, worldwide, to the audience world worldwide. Um, because, yeah, imagination is, as I said, as Aliyah said, um, is, uh, is my text, <laughs> <laughs> is our ultimate tool for change. I mean, it's our vision for the future, it's our preservation of the past. Um, and this is the least we could do, is have a fiction council. So please allow me to extend my gratitude to the University of Michigan, specifically the library represented by Evan. Thank you so much. And the facilitator uh, that was, you know, indirect, <laughs> that connected us together, all Hannah Matar as well. And um, I would like to, um, yeah, so, so thank you so much. Uh, for having me. Um, okay. The Fiction Council, right? Before getting here, I had uh, uh, a visual um, uh, a visual artist friend from Gaza that I asked her actually what would, like if you have any statement that you would like to share with the world. Uh, we're, we're, got it, we're going on a US tour well, that's an ironic thing to be telling uh, a visual artist from, uh, from Gaza. So her question, her answer was this. So, uh, but I was like, okay, I wanted, I wanted to be actually encouraged because this is, this is an opportunity. This is uh, what we have to do. This is what we want to keep our story alive. We want to keep our story going. So I was reminded again with Rafat al Arir's um, piece of poet. I, I, I know if you're familiar, I don't know if you're familiar with it. 
If I must die, you must live to tell my story. It's part of his poem. So I know, I know may, maybe a lot of you recognize this um, quote from uh, Rifat al Ariz, who is a writer, a professor that martyred uh, or wa was killed by a, uh, an, air, an Israeli airstrike last December. Uh, uh, we have, I know we have a lot of, you know, um, calls to action as a fiction council. As you know, we want to preserve, we want to promote uh, our intangible heritage. We want people to know more about us, that we exist. So we have plenty of uh, um, call to action. It's just we have to do this. So I'm going to read some of, you know, I'm quoting some of the Israeli leaders for a recent call to action. Benjamin Netanyahu, Israeli Prime Minister, said, remember what Amalek has done. So we'll get to that in a, in a bit. Yoav Gallant, Israeli Defense Minister, said, we're fighting human animals. Um, Dan Gellerman, former Israeli Ambassador to the United Nations, uh, I'm puzzled by the concern that the world is showing for these horrible inhuman animals. Mordechai Keder, an Israeli scholar, said, equating them to animals is an insult to animals. So if that is not a, um, an, an, an urgent call to, for action, I don't know what it is. So um, about the Amalek, um, if you're interested to know, there's um, a beautiful talk. Uh, if you like, I don't know, maybe we could arrange sharing the link. Um, um, as well, to, to, to learn more, there's a beautiful talk with Dr. Atiyah, Ali Atiyah, I think, um, about you know, the Amalek in the Old Testament. So the ones that defended uh, the Israelis from entering Palestine uh, uh, in the Old Testament, based on the Old Testament, they were the Amaleks, which are the indigenous Palestinian. Yeah, yeah, so people, yes, yeah, sure. Fiction Council. Why do we need a Fiction Council? You know, talking throughout, you know, of having an aspect about having a Fiction Council was not easy. I've been struggling on building the Fiction Council for the past nine years, and it wasn't an easy task for several reasons. And because, in the first place, you will be facing words like nonsense. I mean, who does such a thing? Is it like familiar? Are you, do, do you have a job? I mean, like, what do you do for a living? I'm like, how is that relevant? I was like, you must like, you have to be crushed in the capitalist system not to have an imagination. Like, I was this fanciful child that kept his imagination. I was one of the lucky children that actually tried their best to keep their imagination alive. And I ended up ha building a fiction council. Uh, it started as an initiative in 2015, and now it's registered as a nonprofit. So we have a legal entity. You can sue us <laughs> for all I care about. <laughs> so a fiction council. So the fiction council. Um, I wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah, double what um, Aliyah had said. I just want to share with you. You can see it's over here on my chest. Uh, these are our banners. That's a protocol we're having. Uh, so the, the, the creature on the banner that you've seen, I love that you recognize it. Whenever you see it, this is a fiction council, Jerusalem's Palestine's fiction council. It is uh, a creature I created. It is called Sedanil. Uh, we'll get to the pronunciation in a bit. It's called Sedanil. Uh, Sedanil, this creature represents, you know, represents, let me... I'm going to use this, <laughs> finally. Uh, so it if, you, if you can see, it represents the sea, the, the sky, the land. He's holding uh, a, a book and a brush. And he has um, uh, a, horse, a horse head. So it represents that imagination comes from the sky, from the sea, from the land. It's wild enough that the human is the mediator to all of this. So and that and our outcome goes through literature and visuals. So this is what the creature is all about. It's about, all about being wild in our imagination. Sadanil, <laughs> Sadin in Arabic, whoops, it's not working. I must have envied it. 
Yeah, OK. I'm done. No, I'm good. I'm good. It's, it's, it's working. Whoa. Right. So Sedanil here, um, Sadin in Arabic means you know, protector, preserver, and keeper of the holy place. And El, you know, it's a Semite deity name. And, and I, wanted also, I wanted it to complement you know, the, the, the angels' names. So you know, Gabriel, Mikael. So you've got Sedanil. No. <laughs> it's, it's, it's added. Um, all right, and then the Fiction Council also, unfortunately, it's going through challenges as well. You know, uh, because, because, you know, of the ongoing situation in, in, in Palestine and as well as, you know, trying to get people or more people to recognize the important works that we, we do as well. And, uh, you know, we're trying now to, to, to seek, you know, a place where we could actually host more of our activities. Um, because, you know, it's, it's, still, it's, still, it's, not, it's not easy to find a place in, uh, or a base in Jerusalem at the moment. So these are challenges that we are looking forward to overcome in, in the future, um, hopefully. Um, but we're still, we're still doing, we're doing what we are, uh, what we are um, meant to do. Uh, Alia said also, and things I've already said, that by creative means possible. I mean, like, creative means possible. I will give examples about uh, when, when the genocide out, um, outbroke um, uh, in Gaza and still unfolding, we were trying to know, well, uh, we need an uh, imagination and, and adversity before prosperity, don't we? So uh, we tried to make the imagination care unit so that would have uh, an online, you know, stress relief uh, for second trauma um, through imagination and, uh, um, and, and art. Uh, we had also um, um, uh, moral and psychological support for you know, uh, youth, young youth in Jerusalem for you know, getting over the, the, the harsh circumstances, living circumstances in the city as well due to the unfolding genocide in, in, in Gaza as well. Um, we also, what we did is that with the, um, with the carpet bombing that is actually wiping out buildings and cities in, in Gaza Strip, we actually said, okay, let's, let's try to revive what we can from the Gaza-related Gaza legends. So what we did is that we sent out several uh, ancient, related, uh, ancient, ancient legends related to, to the city of Gaza. One of them, I think I believe everybody knows it. With the, is, is the legend of Samson, Samson the Great. Samson, are you familiar with Samson? He, do you know that he um, he he died in Gaza, the city of Gaza, and the temple of Dagon, which is a Canaanite god. Um, so we have we have these beautiful um, uh, legends related to Deir al-Balah, uh, the, the city of Gaza, and this one here, you might want to look it up. Uh, the, the Gaza municipality, if you manage to look that up, you'll see the phoenix on its, uh, as a logo because it also rises from the, from the ashes. So we look forward for, for the phoenix to rise from the ashes soon enough. Also, we have been investing in the Canaanite, the old Canaanite related to earth, uh, land. Uh, so we have got, or we're trying to reclaim, you know, Adonis, you're familiar with Adonis? Are you familiar with Adonis? Ad or Adoni, Nashtarut? That's a Phoenician, that's a Phoenician Canaanite legend. So, um, and also there's a cut over here, Baal and Yam, El and Baal, and this is Anat. So we're trying to revive also the Canaanite legends and, 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 and um, stories. Also, we're trying to promote that, okay, we need a legend data. Are you familiar with the term? Well, of course we need a legend data. Like, like the legends are dying. Out. So we need something yeah, to give them a bit, of, a bit of, you know, flavor, a bit of life. So it was, we have to do this. Somebody has to stand up and look at, okay, it, even if it's like comic, but we want it. I've been lecturing this I've, 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 uh, about, you know, having a legend later. People are taking me serious. I was like, yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but, this is, but, but this is a necessity. Uh, we've also also getting to uh, getting into business. 
Um, where uh, my, me myself started um, a project called Darb al Ghilan Road of Ghouls, which actually works on documenting paranormal encounter and stories uh, from the from the Palestinian villages, cities, and and towns. Uh, this is our first edition, which is uh, from the old city of Jerusalem. Um, Hidden Companions is its name, Ansel Khafi in Arabic. So basically, it, 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 it tells about the story of you know, uh, several paranormal encounters in the old city of Jerusalem. I turned, the, I turned them into a literary material for our future canon. So in 200 years, years from now, you'll be reading these as folk tales. <laughs> so yes, that's, that's, another, that's another aspect. You might see the Arabic version there. Good news, I'll be sharing with you. There will be an Arabic version printed in New York. Uh, it will come next week, um, hopefully, and there will be a book launch in New York for the, for the book. Thank you. <laughs> OK, let's get to business. So Gin 101, it's for absolute beginners, just a disclaimer. So if you're not familiar with the Gin or you have a previous uh, perception or you know perspective about the gin you might want to forget it for now and put it aside because I'm about to teach you a little bit about you know gin basics so whatever you knew about gin falls let's start from the start all right so gin 01 for absolute beginners let's let's roll terminology first of all I want to point out that there is a, t a translated does not mean trusted so just for your point of view, whenever you hear somebody or, you know, that is not indigenous to the jinn or haven't experienced any jinn encounter, so please get to the indigenous first and then you might want to get a perspective about what he's, what he's saying. So terminology. Okay, the first, the first thing that we might take into consideration is that, okay, what is the pronunciation of it? Is it jinn? Jinn with a D. Genie. Genie. Genii. Let me let me break that let me break that break that up to you. Okay. While in Arabic they indicate multiple things based on Lisan al Arab Ibn Mandur, that's the one the trusted book about you know where, where Arabic words came from, and he collected them. He did uh, some uh, very huge uh, uh, research, and it's considered a source. So while it's being you're debating whether it's jinni or jinn or whatever in arabic it also as a root it refers to plenty of things do you know that it's also connected to the fetus yes let let, let me do the, let me do the math okay so basically what i'm going to do here is you know when it comes to jenna shay or what's concealed the thing in arabic jannan jenna which concealed as if in cover to cover, all right? For starters, that's basic, right? You're following? All right. So basically, Jannah, okay, so and then there's the Janin. Janin in Arabic means fetus, right? Everything that is covered but has a life is a jinn, right? Got that? When a, when a woman is pregnant, there, can you see the, can you see, can you see the, the, the fetus? No. But it's, it's what? It's covered. Right? We're getting, we're getting there? All right? So, so you've got the janine, we've got the fetus, and then al-janan. Al-janan, when it's called, it's, it's named for, for the grave. For what? For holding the dead. For covering the dead. For, and then the spirit also is called al-janan as well. Because it is, the, the body contains it, conceals it. So... We're getting there. Also, when somebody is crazy, he goes like majnoon, right? Are you, are you familiar with this term? He goes like majnoon. Majnoon, he has a mind. Like technically, biologically, he has a brain. But he has no access to it. It's covered, right? So this is, this is what, where the term came from as well. So what else? Al-Jannah, paradise. And by the way, I would... <laughs> Point out a very thank you uh, and gratitude to my friend Jenna Hamid for yeah, being a very <laughs> taking very real, uh, core core <laughs> for her uh, efforts in facilitating uh, some of the, the U.S. trip or the Fiction Council U.S. trip. We're actually making all of it. Uh, so Jenna uh, is when 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 bushes are like you know they intersect a lot that you can't see the the road 
then it's, there's a road, but you cannot see it. So that's where the word paradise or Jannah came from as well. All right, getting where the jinn is coming from? So whatever you knew about jinn, you might put aside once again. And then, again, what is translated? Not necessarily trusted. Familiar with the genius? Right? I'm going to give you a minute to read from Oxford English Dictionary. All right? This is not, no, I mean, like, so I'm not, I'm not going to bore you with reading. I'm going to give you a minute just to read, read out here. Those one, two, three. I'm going I'm to read, I'm gonna read some, some little paragraphs, all right? So here, genius, all right? might mean a guardian spirit similarly associated with a place, institution, thing, in a sea. Genius, now, chilly, historical, okay? Okay. Spirits opposed mutually, opposed to mutually opposed spirits imagined as accompany, uh, accompanying a person throughout his or her life and exerting either a good or bad influence. Right? That is a genius. A genius translates into, for in, in Arabic, as abqari. Okay? Abqari refers to a valley in the Arabian Peninsula that was a home for jinn. <laughs> <laughs> it was a home for jinn. So genius or abqari is actually or Wadi Abqar, or Abqar's Valley, is often associated with Islamic history and Arabian folklore, particularly a story involving jinn and magic. It has been mentioned in the classical Islamic text as a place where jinn were believed to inhabit or gather there, as also references to it in a pre-Islamic poetry and oral traditions as a magical or cursed place. So, genie? Genii. One more thing before we move to genii again. There's a verse in the Quran uh, say, if mankind and jinn gathered in order to produce the like of this Quran, they could not produce the like of it, even if they were to, to, to each other assistance. Referring to what? To Wadi Abqar. So because when the Qur'an was, you know, uh, uh, revealed, it was, the, the, the Prophet Muhammad was accused of, you know, getting to Wadi Abqar and, you know, getting some assistance from a jinn over there that could actually, you know, teach him some poetry. He wasn't a poet. He wasn't um, a crazy man. But this is, you know, some of the uh, accusations that he was facing back then. So, okay. Getting to the stories a bit, right? So I had a friend, she's from England, and she w once mentioned that, um, before, before I introduce her, there's, she mentioned that there is a three-hooded jinn, and she is, she is from Cambria, and she said that there is um, a legend has it that there are spirits there called genii cocolate. Okay? It translates in Celtic as um, three-hooded spirits. While documenting these stories, uh, documenting the paranormal stories in the city of Jerusalem, I came across these three hooded spirits. Interested to know the story? All right. So what happened is that there was a man that actually his father, while praying, the, uh, um, like dawn prayer, uh, the, the, he came across you know, these three spirits holding his young brother out of his crib outside. This is the next day his, his little brother passed away. It's, beca it's, it's, become, it's become the, the, the place where they, were, they started questioning, why do we see those three-headed spirits? Then the whole building became abandoned because of this reputation that this young man and his father are seeing ghosts or seeing spirits roaming the house in the old city of Jerusalem. Now, they did an, a renovation of the house. 
they figured out that there is a cave under the house of three tombs that they don't know for which period or era they belong to. Some say that they came from with Salah al um, while he you know, on his quest to open Jerusalem or to take back Jerusalem. So this is my illustration of it. <laughs> this is my illustration of it. And you know, on the on the on the left side, these are the, these, the, those found in those are found in in, in England. So, th so it's, it's, it's it's as complicated as that. I wanted to add a little bit of, uh, of uh, context, a little bit of context as well about you know um, what the creatures might um, look like in the jinn world as well. You might think that this is an Arab folktale thing, but it's a it's a fashion. It is a Scottish. But what I did is that I had a reference in the Arabic or a, a trace of the Arabic jinn next to it. We have that. Like, come on, Scottish. Get like, um, be more authentic. I mean, like, we have that before. So we're, what we're going to share with you is just a little bit of, you know. In Arabic folklore, nasnas, Romanized nasnas. <laughs> I don't know why they're Romanizing it. So plural, nasnases. Uh, is a monstrous creature, according to Edward Lane. <laughs> That's funny, I'm, because I'm quoting. Because <laughs> remember, translated is not always trusted. So whatever. Uh, Thousand and One Nights. <laughs> he's, refer he's referencing One Thousand and One Nights. <laughs> Anyways, having a half head, half a body, one arm, one leg, with which it hops with much agility. Okay, so it was believed to be the offspring of a jinn called the ship. A ship is a half. All right, interesting, right? So in the Palestinian folklore, we have a a, 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 a story or a folk tale called Nusinsis. All right, are you familiar with the term? No, Nusinsis is half the half. All right. So it's a quarter. <laughs> so there was a big debate whether he was half the half, you know, vertically or horizontally. <laughs> so and then, OK, but like if, if he said vertically, then he's not walking. But if he said, you know, um, uh, horizontally, then OK. Oh, well, oh, my, we, we, have, we, have a, we have a problem. <laughs> and then, OK, no, no, no. This is like so tiny that he's like this tall. But he, but he managed to, you know, to win a goal. Okay, so it's it's more of an empowering, you know, uh, a story for little uh, people, uh, by all means. Originals, all right. We have the originals. I mean, like you, you have to, yeah, you have to like to agree. I mean, like you might not, but you know, the historical aspect to it makes you want to believe that it's it's. Our thing. Fun fact. Interested for a while? Fun fact? Right? Okay, fun fact. Do you see those symbols? They are collected in a book called The Lesser Key. Are, are you familiar with this book? It is claimed to be a book that is gathered actually uh, by or written by King Solomon. You know, King Solomon is, is well known for, you know, controlling jinn. You didn't know that? No. All right. Well, that's, that's, that's news. <laughs> so um, these are 72 symbols of very powerful jinn that were documented in the book The Lesser Key. You might want to grab it. It's, it's, an interesting, it's a very interesting book. And these are the symbols of the jinn that, he was, that they were serving him. All right? Uh, so since King Solomon decided to be based or located in, you know, in, in, in Palestine, but nobody knows where he was exactly. So um, a fun fact, how many, how many jinns did, we, did I say? 72. Okay, there is a surah in Al-Quran, a chapter in Al-Quran. Uh, it's called Al-Jinn, the jinn. Guess what, in, what, in, 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 which, in which order it was? 72. Fun fact, isn't it? Right? Uh, all right. 
I chose I chose one I chose one from the from this list to introduce you like like closely. You may you want you may want to meet her. Uh, it's on on the on the on the left. Her name is Paimon, or Paimon. Okay, that's her symbol. It's called Sigo. You know that's when you like don't, don't try this at home. Like don't don't try to scribble her symbol. She's like so she gets so tickly and. No, 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 I don't want to get to the humans. Oh. <laughs> so that's her symbol. What I want you to notice is her, her bird-like leg, right? I've got a representation. I'll get, you, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to what I want in a bit. So um, the bird-like leg that is found in Byron. Are you, did you know that? Did you know that sirens have bird's legs? You know, the, you're always connecting them to the mermaids, right? Boring. Like, you know, there's a... a <laughs> <laughs> they have to be connected somehow and, you know, more interesting creatures. Like, you know, we have harpies. Like, there are harpies. But, you know, sirens, like the birdie ones, they are more interesting. You know, you get to know them. They're fun. Uh, so, sirens... Um, have bird legs. I'm going to share a story that I collected from Jerusalem, and then we'll get to the real deal. So there is a story that was collected from the, uh, from the old city of Jerusalem, claiming that in one house, they're no longer calling them that, but in the original Ottoman uh, manuscripts, it states that it's called Beit al-Ghula, or the house of the Ghula, female ghoul. All right? Don't, say, don't tell that to anybody because the, the family itself don't like to be called like their houses because it's, I mean, like for real estate, it's going to drop. I mean, no, <laughs> nobody, wants, nobody wants to live with a gula, <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> so the gula that they have seen in their house is actually a leg, uh, a, a, bird, a birdie leg, a two-story height genia that is actually... Uh, taking a bath near the well uh, at their courtyard. So nobody's talking about this now. Maybe the first generation is traumatized. They don't speak about it. They left the house. The house is more or less empty. So birdie leg, right? Birdie legs. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you. I might be a bit exaggerating. Right? I might be a bit exaggerating. It's like, yeah, you're comparing some, you know, mythological creatures to a goddess? Oh, uh, yeah. That's what I'm doing. Because these mythological creatures, those goddesses, might be a representations of the jinn. So taking the jinn out of a stereotypical concept into, you know, this more widely open one, makes you understand why they were worshipped in Palmyra. There were eight temples in Palmyra, you know, Zenobia, in Palmyra, Syria, that there are eight temples. Uh, the, the, first, the first to be is called Selma, and she has brothers, you know, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. So she, was not, she, was, yeah, she wasn't Snow White, but like, she was the jinn. There were eight temples of worshipping jinn in Palmyra. So when it comes to these powerful creatures, these powerful, mystical, powerful creatures, why not be goddess or god or gods or goddesses if they're jinn? They're shapeshifters. We'll get to the ghouls in a bit. I wanted to share with you, before we finish, I wanted to share with you, this is, uh, since we're talking about end of time, <laughs> obviously, in the Middle East. Uh, and this, is, this, is, this plaque, the ivory plaque, was found in the city of Megiddo, the old Canaanite city of Megiddo. Are you familiar with it? Har Megiddon? Megiddon? Uh, so basically, it's, it's been stated in the Old Testament that, or, the, or in the Bible, that the last battle on earth is going to happen on this uh, mountain. Anyhow, I wanted to point out, you know, this is um, a Canaanite prince, lovely, 
And you, did you see this? That's a, a, a sphinx. Where is it now? University of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, ironic, isn't it? <laughs> so it's another, it's another uh, Canaanite piece. Interested? <coughs> Interested, right? So types of gin. Some people might, you know, mix types of gin with the gin ranks. We do have that. Did you know that? Or all gin? No. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. But it's not how it works. We have, mainly we have, has the what, three types. Gin that flies in the air. Gin that actually could be, take the sh forms of snakes and dogs. And gin that actually roam and travel. And by travel, I mean they could be the light gin, the lunar gin, the fire gin, the water gin, the earth gin, the air gin. Familiar? Yes. OK. The ranks. Interested? Of course. You, that's why you came here. I mean, like. <laughs> <laughs> OK. When talking about the ranks, so when, it, when, you're, when we're talking about a baby, you know, I don't know what it is, but it's a baby, it's a cute gin, it's fooling around the house, it's chubby, then it's, it's generally, it's a ginny, right? So when, it, when you see, I don't know, um, there are like, when sometimes I don't want to scare you, and th that's not scientifically proven, so don't take me, <laughs> not my word for granted, all right? So some say that they were like, um, they're playing with their, their toddlers or their, you know, their babies, and suddenly they see that the baby's looking to the ceiling, right? Oh, everybody agrees. <laughs> so that is an arwah. That is a type, a rank of jinn that actually likes to mess with little children, with human children. You know, they tickle them, they make them laugh, they make them smile, they do something, you know, shenanigans in the sky that they could actually relate to and make them you know, like more fun for the babies, because they know that the babies are the only ones that actually see them. All right? Interesting, right? So uh, the, 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 the next, okay, the, 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 the next rank is, you know, al-amr, which is, you know, the jinn that actually lives with, it, with people. Actually, d like generally, jinn do not, like, what I'm saying is that from an Arab Muslim perspective, I don't know, we might have something in common if you, if you, if you agree or disagree, that's up to you. But what I'm saying is that there are um, a type of the jinn that actually enjoys living with humans. But like, we've been here first. I mean, like, uh, d just don't bother us. Don't spill hot water at in the middle of the night. Don't spill hot water in the sewers. But like, this is where we live. I mean, like, seriously? Then it becomes more interesting, more intriguing as well to, n to learn that these don't mind. Some of them are righteous. They don't mind living with us. And I've documented plenty of stories from the old city of Jerusalem about righteous jinn. Only the other day, I, was, um, I met this, um, this resident of the old city, and she was like, she heard me, she, she heard me while um, I was like, bringing, bringing the topic up, and I was like, um, me, me and my friend were talking about you know, the jinn um, re um, uh, resides in, in, in the, the old city of Jerusalem. And she was like, yeah, I can relate to that. Uh, she, we have two ones, like two, two jinn Omar uh, from the Amr jinn that actually live in our house. One, she was so nice. I'm like, she just appears to us and that's it. I'm like, you're serious? I was like, yeah, she's nice. She doesn't do, she doesn't do us any harm. It's like, she's, she's nice. She's around. And the other one is like vicious. I mean, like, yeah, we, we don't like to deal with her much. I'm like, yeah. Is this following me, or, or, or I'm like, it's, it's, it's real? But then I figured out that it's real. This is, this is, how, this is the norm. Um, shayateen, Satan, Satans. This is a, this is, um, a shaitan or Satan. I'm going to break it down to you. Simple, easy peasy. So when, when a Muslim say shaitan, all right, that refers to an, an infidel jinn. Easy. See? 
Was it hard? But they're still powerful. <laughs> there, are, there are more powerful, which is Al-Marid. OK. Remember the genie, the blue genie from Aladdin? So you go like, ooh, that's a, that's a blue genie. Well, technically, that's a Marid. That is not a genie from a Muslim perspective. But you know, who cares? I'm like, yeah, genie, everything's genie. All right? But it's the genie. Afrit is the most highest powerful ever. Right? Am I, am I blocking so well? Yeah, you're good. So, yeah. And on your right, remember when I said about the jinns that love to live with humans? That's a depiction of how he might look like. He likes eating snakes and stuff. Uh, don't, don't mind him. And like, that's, that's his thing. We don't, we, don't, we don't interfere with that. But that's one thing. Are you familiar with the word? Iblis? Yeah? That's an original. Okay, but that didn't happen in Palestine. We cannot like it. It happened, it happened like uh, it happened so, somewhere. So this is a depiction of, you know, uh, angels obeying Adam and Iblis disobeying. I'm going to give you a fun fact. In the Sufi order, there is a saying, all right? In the Sufi order, there's a saying that Iblis, or Azazil, if you want to, if you want to name him like when he used to, he was a beautiful jinn. He was made, he's, he's a jinni. But ironically, what took him to the, par to, to the heavens is that jinn ha having wars against each other. And he was this righteous, some say he was a baby, some say he was a pious. But he was taken as a baby, baby to the heavens because they saw potential in that child. So when he was asked, and he grew up in the heavens, so, and he was called the peacock of the angels um, because he was so pretty. So when, he, when, when God asked him to you know, bend the knee <laughs> to humans, he refused. And the Sufi order, or the Sufis, consider that an act of love. I'm not obeying because I love you so much. And I, I wouldn't bow for someone that I feel that I'm, I'm made of something better than him. Humans are like a mass that moves slowly. <laughs> They're made of mud. I'm made of fire. I'm lighter. I'm more powerful. Humans like lazy creatures. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not bending the knee to those creatures. So he had a conversation, a very interesting conversation in the Quran, um, when, because he asked, Allah didn't curse him right away. He was like, uh, in the Quran it says, وَعِزَّتِكَ وَجَلَالِكَ O Almighty Allah, uh, can you show me the resurrection day? And he said, O oh, shall you see the resur resurrection day? He saw what, like, and he was like, I will sit on the righteous path of your uh, servants until the resurrection day. And then and Allah replied, replied to him, it's like you and you will be cursed by then. Until then, sorry. So remember these American movies where they started, you know, getting uh, villain movies out to get you, you know, having some compassion to the villains? and understanding their stories, right? They're starting producing movies like Maleficent and The Joker, right? They just want you, you know, to have some feelings for, for, for the villains. I don't know, no, nothing can justify an act of terror. I mean, like, even if I knew his backstory, you could have channeled this power elsewhere. But you chose this path. This is not worthy of, you know, my compassion. I'm sorry. Huh. Nobody can, uh, can, can object on that. Solomon is the, another reference to, you know, whatever uh, gin story out there. Somebody ha with a fanciful imagination would actually add so much power to it. But as you can see here, I'm going to point out something. This is the Queen of Sheba. All right? She's coming on her throne. This is King Solomon. This is a simorg. This is the Persian bird. 
uh, and this is the Afrit, which has, to, has, has been said that he was the one to bring her throne, or was in the, you know, because King Solomon used to sit, and there was this whole jinn around him. They were surrounded with jinn, like he can see them, like, I can see you now, no comparison. I want to get back once again to Jerusalem, and I would add, there's a, that's a verse in the Quran, it says, it translates, with the angels on its sides, one that day, I mean the resurrection day, eight, might, eight mighty angels will bear the throne of your Lord above them. Okay, so we're talking about eight angels. Are you familiar with the Dome of the Rock? Are you familiar with this? People are like, are, are you? People are dying for this. Uh, but still, we have, we have a lot to say. It's an octangle shape. Can you count the columns of the, the, that are surrounding the, that are holding the dome? Fun fact, eight. So sometimes the legends actually do reflect on architecture. So, um, and you can see that, uh, you can see the, the rock here uh, that actually, <laughs> remember when we talked about legend, legends? That's, um, that's a legendary thing as well. Fun fact, it has zero attachment to the original uh, Burak, which is the creature that carried Prophet Muhammad from, you know, from Mecca to Jerusalem, uh, because it's more like, let me show you. No. I'll, we'll, I'll get that. I'll, I'll get. I'll get to that in a bit. Um, do we still have? Do we still have time? Yeah. So we've got that. We're back to Jerusalem. Woohoo! Uh, sorry. And then we're going to talk like very briefly about you know jinn and the Palestinian folk tales. We'll get to that. Having said all the previous, all the above, all, all like, like the, 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 the things, now you'll see where am I heading. References for our folk tales, right? So we've got the ghouls. <laughs> Can you guess who this guy is? Can you? He's an orientalist. Plenty of orientalists. <laughs> You can't, keep, you can't pick from. That's Antoine Galan. Antoine Galan, okay, that's, that, that, that's a case because I don't like him. Anyway. <laughs> Antoine Galan is the uh, French Orientalist that translated one Ar Arabian Nights or one, 1001 Nights from, from Arabic to French. And he was the one to boost all of this for the West world to learn about, you know, the, 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 the Arab, you know, that turned into, you know, um, um, <laughs> fetishes and, uh, you know, admiration and all that. So, ghouls, I'm going to share with you a message that I received from an American. He calls himself um, a paranormal researcher. I don't know what that is, but is that a term? Like, is it, is it used? I mean, like, from an academic perspective, is it used, a paranormal researcher? I don't know that you could call it academic, but... <laughs> yeah, I mean... Yeah. <laughs> Right? So it is, it is I mean, it's, 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 it's intriguing. Like he called himself, I'm a paranormal researcher from the United States. Uh, okay, he's talking about the article that was written about my work. And then he come, came from, I am aware our American concept of ghouls is a misrepresentation created by Antoine Galanz. That's an American confession, which is, which is fine by me. Uh, so, and he was like, do we, do we, do we have to agree? I was like, hell no, I'm sorry. But like, hell no, you cannot agree with what Galanz has to say. He has nothing. He only translated. He has no right to say whatever he wants or any take on anything. So, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, I'm, I ruined the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so, ghouls again. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to 
Um, yes, um, simplify the ghouls once again. Classical ghouls, they are from the jinn. They're a rank from the jinn, okay? They're demons. They're, they're witchcraft, they're witchers, sorry. They're witchers, they're sorcerers that actually know how to open portals from their parallel universe into ours. They appear to you in every single form and shape. They don't care. They want to lead you astray in the deserts so that you lose your way and die. So, ghul in Arabic, or ghul in, Engr in English, is actually an authentic Arabic <coughs> creature. So please, uh, mind your own business with it. <laughs> so, and... So ghouls are actually, this is, this, is, this is the classical ghoul. So when it comes to ghouls, this is the ghoul, all right? So when anybody tells you, uh, I know a ghoul in the cemetery, it's like, no, this is one, not what Ahmed said. <laughs> Ahmed said that ghouls or classical ghouls are shapeshifters that are actually in the deserts. They roam the deserts, and they lead people astray to their parish. All right? Funny enough, uh, let's move to something uh, like criticizing some American pop culture. So, are, are you, you're, I, think, I believe you're, you're familiar with the, the movie Night of the Living Dead, 1968. That's an American pop culture. George uh, Romero said, I never, I never called our zombies. We thought of them as ghouls. So... I want, you, I want to add a little bit of concept to the zombie, which would, uh, I would, would highly invite you uh, to, to look out the word in zombie, which is, uh, was recorded as a name of the god of the Congo, people as early as the early 16th century by Portuguese who visited the kingdom of Congo. So you, you might want to search that up before watching an, uh, uh, an upcoming zombie movie. Oh, and there's, and there's an interesting link. Uh, it's actually for the University of Michigan. Uh, we'll find a way also to share that link with you. Um, so I don't know. It, the, uh, it happens to be somebody at the, Mich at the University of Michigan wrote that article about you know, zombies and where they orig originated from. Ruins and natural resources. This is where the Palestinians also get their stories from. I know a relative to my father that actually died out of fear while seeing some jinn. There were chubby, white, jumping uh, around the well. So when the moment she saw them, she ran to her husband. She wanted to collect some water. And then this is where she find, found out about these little, tiny, white, chubby creatures. Uh, and she ran home. She was shivering until she died uh, the next morning. And so water resources, if you can see this, uh, and seeing them uh, in water, I mean, and I have another story that I collected is about, you know, a man that's, that saw three sh uh, sheep in, a, you know, in the pool confronting the well, the spring, okay? So while, the, while the, he wanted to, he, he thought that they, they, they can't get out. So the moment he got in the pool to get out, he like, he slapped the water as if it's the, the sheep. Then he figured out that he was, um, he's not seeing any sheep. There is no sheep. So he's on medication now. <laughs> no, seriously, I know, I know the guy. <laughs> uh, 1001 Nights, I want, you to, I want to point out, can you read? Yeah, of course you can. <laughs> the genius comes out of the jar. Genius. Another, another one here. The genius and the merchants. This is the first story in the Arabian Nights. And Sinbad carried, this is not irrelevant. Uh, so this is another interesting thing. OK, um, we're, we're about to, we're about to, um, to finish. Uh, this one, patterns for the jinn. So in Palestinian culture, there is, or folklore, there has, they have to have, have hooves at their gin. Whether camel, cows, cattle, sheep, 
tooth. Um, and this is not this is not Palestinian, but I wanted to to point out that we the, the remember you know ring the black hair, it is a pattern. So it's whenever you like there is a black hair involved, there has to be long black hair. I don't know if it's, if it's a gym thing, but apparently it's a gym thing. They love black hair, or appearing as if they are having having black hair. You want to point? You want to look it up? This is a character that I've illustrated while documenting creatures from the uh, paranormal creatures from the old city of, Jer of Jerusalem. And I figured out that it looks like a gnome, right? So we have, we have something in common. <laughs> right? Another that is actually related to natural resources, which is, this, this is um, 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 a, a Japanese legend. And if you're interested, I could tell you the story. Um, uh, interested? Yeah. yeah. Okiki, I think it's, uh, th that's her name. She was a servant to a very wealthy samurai family. Uh, the father was, yeah, desired her, that servant, and uh, she rejected him the first time, so he wanted to set her up and uh, uh, con uh, like accuse her that she had stolen one of the you know, dishes. <laughs> so, and, uh, or broken one of the like, samurai dishes. So this is, this is how it went. So in, in that case, you're, 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 you're punished to die. So she was like, I'm going to look for the dish. You, you, I didn't break it, so I'm going to look for the dish. She was like, that is another rejection. So what he did, what she, what, what he did is that he threw her into the well and died. Um, so this is a pattern, by the way. So whenever you hear some voices that you cannot identify where they come from, Remember to look that if there's a water source around. All right, I'm, I'm gonna get you um, freaked out a little bit now. But it is actually, that's when he started hearing, count, like counting, he was counting the plates. One, two, three, until eight, until 10, I haven't broken the plate. One, two, three, every single night, she was uh, repeating that until he couldn't take it anymore and he took his own life, finally. <laughs> it, took him, it took him some time. <laughs> it took him some time to do that. So we're glad that he died. In Arabic uh, belief, if you hear a voice of somebody in a specific place, let's say every single day, if you hear his voice or you see his image and that is a perished person, like it's a dead person, that means that he was killed or murdered. And that is his companion from the jinn calling for justice. So he loved that person so much he had to go through all of this in order to you know, I mean, like he's crossing parallel universes just to, you know, uh, materialize to us in order to, to, um, to protect or to, to have his companion and some justice. Um, why don't they fight with us? I mean, like they have their own world. They have children. They have wars. They have everything. That they're not there just to bother us. I mean, like... <laughs> They're not there just to, you know, fool, fool around with us. Of course, there are, you know, we have, we have, we have you know, um, uh, nasty, you know, youth that they, they want to tease people. They do the same. They, you know, they, we have plenty that actually would like to pra, uh, practice some, you know, some sort of sorcery or witchcraft. They do that as well, but on a parallel universe, not ours. But when they want to get to ours, they have to get through a materialized body. That's why they possess people. And yeah, and this is a very kind invitation to whomever wants to practice. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, please don't. It's not a game. It's not fun. When you're when you have well, like <laughs> when you watch a thriller, that's 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 it. You don't you don't want to get into the business. They don't, they don't miss. 
So do Palestinians have, so Palestinians have imagination? Palestinians have a fiction council. Thank you. So um, if you would like to ask Ahmed any questions about his work, or tell your own, tell us your own gin story, please do. Just dying to tell this because <laughs> <laughs> it was not a real gin story. I mean, I have some, but growing up, my grandmother used to always, when you mentioned Afri, Al Afrit, Wal Mai Sukhni, and the hot water, she would say, and you do never, we were Christian, but never pour wo hot water into the sink without doing the sign of the cross because the Afrit's children could be playing in there. And if you scald them, they're going to come after you. So I don't know. I mean, I think she must have believed it because what is what is what was so wrong of pouring <laughs> with pouring hot water into the sink? I don't know, but that's is what I how I grew up. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so and then. What happened is that um, uh, they, they <laughs> obviously they called the sheikh <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> and then they told, them, they told them, did you did you burn something at home? They're like, yes. Uh, they were like, you accidentally killed a jinn's, a jinnia's son. So she does not want you to live here anymore or come near this house. So their house in the old city is empty. Because when they wanted to return the house, they saw blood splatter all over the walls. And um, they, 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 they can hear screaming every single night. So that's a pattern. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a pattern. That's, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm glad your, your mom did so. <laughs> hey, uh, thank you for this. This was great. Thank you. Um, uh, two questions. One was, have you ever heard of this book, uh, Ramallah, Folklore, Songs, and Tradition? It's in Arabic. Uh, unfortunately. Okay, just I, I found it in my Tita's house uh, when we were clearing it out. And yeah. uh, Anyway, two, uh, my Tita used to say to us when we were kids, for some reason when we would do this. Yes. Dance moves, she would say, "Don't do that. That's the sign of the devil." And uh, and that's if you're so, generating. Yeah, I, I don't, you know, but there was never an explanation. Like, and so, like, whenever we'd be just dancing as kids, and then all of a sudden, like, one of us would do this, she'd go, "Ah," you know, and yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and just, the whistle? Did she did she mention the whistle? Uh, there wasn't Whist a whistling at night. No, there wasn't. It was just that motion she said that was like the sign of death or the sign of the, the devil, and so and that was about the extent of the uh, explanation. Yes. Uh, but that, as a kid, that was something that came up, you know, when we accidentally, you know, did that move. <laughs> <laughs> do you know? Do you know? I have a friend who actually goes like, if you whistle at night, then you gather the gin. So they they used to play this game. It's funny. Uh, so they go like. When you, it's, it's, also, it's, it's also known that when you read Ayatul Kursi, which is a verse in the Quran, that burns, that burns out jinn. Okay? If they get closer to you when you read it, it burns out jinn. So what they used to say, they used to do, is that set a trap by whistling at night, and the moment they whistle, afterwards, they will start, start reciting Al Kursi. So it's a slaughterhouse for the jinn. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yes. Yes, go ahead. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. I wanted to share, my family's from South Asia, so India and Pakistan uh, mostly, and um, there was this kind of um, recommendation my grandmother would have, is like when we were children going into our adolescence, um, we had long black hair. Yes. And she's like, do not go outside at Maghrib time with your hair untied near the trees. Wow. Very specific like, you know, um, uh, advice about this kind of thing. So I was just wondering about the whole long black hair kind of like path.
pattern you talk about, and yes. if you've heard that from other cultures as well. Asian Asian culture, and not necessarily Asian, but also I've wit I, I've I've documented stories in in Jerusalem itself with the long black hair. Um, I am investigating at the moment. <laughs> I mean, like I'm looking through the patterns. This is the f like the. Uh, like the, the furthest that I could get to at the moment is just, I know it's a pattern, but I'm still un I'm unsure whether it's, uh, what's, what's the purpose of it? Because I know that a story, uh, there was this child that was wanted by a princess. She was sent her as his servant. That was uh, also a documented story from the old city. Um, and they used to, um, they, used, they, they wanted him because she wanted him as a mediator into our world. So she used to appear to him on a beautiful, uh, like, he was like, I, I, I did not see any, w like, a, a, a female fa figure more beautiful than that with a very long black hair and a yellow snake. Do the math. Yes? It's, it's there, but I'm still investigating so far. Nobody gave me answers. But, uh, yeah. Any questions? <laughs> yes. Hi, Ahmed. So um, I'm from Egypt, and um, we all know in Egypt that the jinn mostly live in the bathroom. <laughs> and <laughs> my mom would always tell us, yeah, I mean, don't cry in the bathroom, because yeah, if you she cry... She doesn't want you to cry. Well, but, but no, she actually didn't mind me crying. <laughs> but <laughs> but <laughs> just not in the bathroom, because then, <laughs> then the jinn will... Y yeah. Uh, yeah. So in, in Palestine, do they also mostly live in the bathroom, or do they live... <laughs> uh, can I just, on top of <laughs> <laughs> the dua for uh, entering the bathroom is Allahumma inna na'udhu bika min al-hudhi wal khabath. Khabath, yeah, khabath, I didn't yeah. see that word in all of your different terms for jinn. So do you know how that term relates? Is it a different category? or what? al khubth wal khabath is also related to jinn. Okay? Like, uh, it's not, it's not, it's just your... You're setting a, ba a, ba a barrier between you and the paranormal world. You make, you're securing it as if you're looking, locking your door. Then you can cry. Y yeah, well, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Like, like if, but yes, they do live in the, the bathroom. But when it, when it, when if, we, if we happen to look at the, the ranks, that's a very minimal, you know, that's a cutie. I mean, uh, that lives, you know, under the sink, right? He goes, the to yes, the toilet, under the toilet. Like, he's so tiny. Like, he fits under there. And you know, whatever. Like these are like th from the Omar, which is the resident jinns. They might be from you know little ch that that jinns children, but they must probably be a, sh a, sh a shayateen, uh, j infidels, because they like dirty places. So it's not it's not necessarily the bathroom. It could be any it could be any dumpster uh, uh, out there. But they we have we have the same pattern. Yes. Hi, thank you so much for this amazing presentation. It reminded thank you. me of uh, last year. Uh, me and my friends, we have a group chat, and my friend, um, she's Yemeni. Well, I guess that's not really important to the story, but maybe it, it is. It is. You know about it Yemeni. is. <laughs> it uh, is. Folklore. Yeah, believe me. She I know. was telling us about how her mother was. Um, Oh, was uh, she had like a jinn? She said there was a whole village of jinn living inside her, and they had to. Yeah, it was crazy. Uh, like I couldn't even believe it when she was telling the story. Um, she said that they had to bring the sheikh into their home to bring to do the exorcism, okay. and then when the sheikh was talking to the jinn, the jinn was like, the sheikh was like, who did this? Like, when did you come into the body? The sheikh, the jinn was like, 20 years ago. There's a whole village of us, and the sheikh was like, grilling the jinn like he was trying to get him out, and the and the sheikh was like, do you want to become like a Muslim? Do you want to turn to Allah? And the and like and the the thing is that the jinn was like an underling because there was the ranks, and ah, um, okay. so he was like, I'm scared of what they'll do to me. It was it was a really crazy story. Uh, it is. So, so the sheikh was like, "I'll turn you into a Muslim." So the jinn did the shahada, and then the the sheikh named the jinn Abdullah. So, uh, so it was like that's it was a really whole crazy. level of yeah, convert. That's a whole level of converting. I'm like yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. So and then um, and then she just gave more details about the exorcism. Like her mom's eyes turned black, and like when she was texting us this, this was like. I don't even remember why we were talking about this in the first place, but like it was, <laughs> I couldn't even believe it. But I guess now I'm I'm not so sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I'm sure that happens, but it's fun. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. I'm gonna echo what a wonderful and thought-provoking presentation. Um, 
uh, you know, I this is a f family story that has been told to us that like something that happened to or it's always somebody's nephews, brothers, blah blah blah. <laughs> and and it's uh, it, this was set in the early 1900s um, in India, and and okay. your um, that slide that showed the hoofs and the open the yes. that's let loose that jogged my memory for that because the story goes that the man arrives of course middle of the night in a train station that's abandoned and going to the village and has a uh, in a in a uh, coach basically a horse driven carriage. And as he's going through the wilderness, he comes across um, a fully decked bride. And if you can imagine, India uh, uh, bridal colors are red, and they're yeah. they're head to toe, basically with the, with the put, with it, the put in put in uh, the feet. I don't uh, the feet thing is I know what you're talking about, but in yeah. this case, what happened was being chivalrous. He had the carriage stopped, and he was helping her on, and he saw the hoofs. Wow. Uh, for hands as he was like being very chivalrous and and so he yelled to the coachman to speed out of there and um, after a while he got out near the city turns told the guy the coachman that you know this is what happened and the coachman said all I saw was that you asked me to stop the coach and then you were yelling something out and he said you didn't see this woman she had she had hands, hoofs for hands, and the coachman goes like this. Wow. And his hands are hoofs. <laughs> so all I can, th I, I mean, I'm thinking, when. That's, can, that, that's, that's a pattern. Must be a, must be a prank that was pulled. And so the, the man runs into the city, um, aunt's house is where he was going, uh, frantically knocks on the door, aunt opens the house, to, uh, the door tells her the story um, that, you know, there's a bride over here, and who who would have thought? And then the coachman, and and she says, "You are completely gone out of your mind. Come in." And she's like, "No, no, no. You have to see. There's this coachman who with the hands for hopes." And the aunt says, "Like this." <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, this, I don't know. Of course, as children, we were we were always intrigued by the by the rep <laughs> repetitive. Story, <laughs> <laughs> but the backwards feet. I think you're talking backwards about. Backwards feet. We, yes, they're called pitcher That's fairies. a pattern. I've, that's a pattern. I've, I've, um, the, uh, I've heard that plenty of you know uh, Pakistani sharing the same, the same, yeah. uh, as well as um, um, uh, an Indian as well shared a, a similar story with me as well. Uh, so yeah, that's a pattern. Uh, backwards, backwards feet. Did you? Did, can you imagine the backwards feet, like these? Feet, but then I can. I, I'm standing, but they're backwards. Yeah, you'll see like some ancient Indian miniature paintings in which they they represent that with backwards feet. So yes. this was a, this was a very entrenched concept in the Indian folklore. Yes, uh, and a very intriguing one. Yes. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. You'll you'll you'll, you'll get you'll get a mic. Yeah. This is probably the wrong talk to leave my long black hair open today. <laughs> <laughs> my, <feet. laughs> um, my question was, um, I actually had a question. You mentioned, I may, I may have missed this part, but you mentioned like um, the jinn, a jinn have, having, um, like having justice for his companion. Can you explain that, uh, that relationship a little bit more? Because um, I thought that was really Okay, important. so there is, a f from, a, from, a, from a Muslim uh, religious perspective, we believe that there are like um, a companion jinn that accompanies you the moment you, you're being born until you die. Okay? So his mission throughout these years is to keep you astray from, you know, the right path. All right? So uh, sometimes these companions fall in love with you. Okay? And... Uh, and then it's a win-win situation. What, what do I mean by that? I mean, we like to go, we love to go astray. And then he loves to get us astray. So it is a win-win thing. But sometimes it bothers him that we don't actually follow his lead. Or with that, we don't follow his command, like his commands, or I don't know, whatever he does. Uh, no. No, <laughs> no, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a wide, it's a wide thing. It's a worldwide thing. Yes, 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 yes. We have, we have the same. Like in, in. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, oh, oh, the, a fun fact. Every every jinn is every angel is a jinn, but not every jinn is an angel. Because they're lies, but we cannot see them. Remember? Sorry. Uh, Al-Qarin, yes. Al-Qarin is always related to Shayateen. Oh, yes. Okay, okay. Uh -huh. okay. They're call it's called Al-Qarin. Al-Qarin, yes. Al-Qarin. Okay, K-A-R-E-E-N, -E -E if you want to look them up. Yeah. Oh, they're, they're, oh by the way, um, I want to share this story with you. So basically, uh, <laughs> since mentioning the Qarin, there is a Qarina. Okay? A Qarina, which is a female Qarin. <laughs> Never mind. This Karina, as a companion, actually targets uh, pregnant women. And it's been documented in my family as well. So uh, before miscarriage, uh, they dream that there is a woman following them. So when they wake up, they see blood on the, on the, on the sheets. So oh, the next day, they miscarriage. So that's a pattern. That's a very... Um, uh, it's a very known pattern. I, I know it from two cases in my family. There was one where I was sitting with my mom and a relative, uh, re relative of ours. She was saying that I dreamed that there was this woman following me. And me and my mom, like, straightforward, looked at a, an eye contact right away. She had a miscarriage two days after. So um, I know it's, it might sound a little, you know, made up. But I don't, I, I'm not here to make you believe me. I mean, <laughs> I'm here to share some stories as well. So yeah, uh, anybody else? We have time for maybe two more people, and then we have to wrap up. Uh, super, super quick. Um, yeah. So you were earlier, um, we were mentioning uh, like whistling at night, which is also a Native American and Indigenous uh, First Nations, like a lot of cultures in America, share not whistling at night. It's a pattern. I just was curious, what are your thoughts on patterns, though? Like, what is, like, the context of other cultures around the world sharing similar traits around their culture? Like, do you have thoughts on why that happens or what's kind of the symbiosis of why those things happen across the world? This is a very broad question. Yeah. Um, so I would love to, like, I'm, I'm open to, to, to have a, a very deep conversation in this regard. I mean... Uh, yeah, I would love to, to learn the context uh, out of it because studying patterns, well, actually, when, I'm, when anybody tells me that the first thing that I asked a psychologist and a psychiatrist, because some go like, but maybe if he, he has a mental or a psychological illness. And I was like, and I, and I went to a, psychologi a psychologist and I went to a psychiatrist and I asked them a very straight, direct question. If anybody with mental illness or psychological illness or disorder, do they see a pattern? Is there a pattern for this you know, specific deal? Let's go, let's say he has a schizophrenia. Is there a pattern that all patients see? And he goes like, no. I'm like, okay, then it's gin. Because every, everybody with a single trauma uh, has their own reference or a, a, a visual background so this is, that reflects on what he sees on a daily basis, for instance, because he's been traumatized, for instance. So he has his own experience reflected into a disease. But I am very much open to discussing um, if there were, you know, intersections or something we have in, in common. That would be uh, an honor. Uh, I have a question, uh, not question, but uh, in Zoroastrian in Iran is yes. before Islam. Yes. And um, uh, Ahriman is a jinn. Right. But always uh, symbolized for bad things. Mm -hmm. And uh, Zoroaster said every human has an angel and Ahriman. Yes. And you have to defeat that with your action. Right. You can remove all those shayateen or rahriman. Right. And uh, another uh, thing I want to mention, uh, like uh, that seven things you... Uh, 72? Defined, yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, it was very similar to Zoroastrianism and Native American. Because yes. Because the fire, for example, in Zoroastrian, uh, when you go to their uh, religious uh, place, they have fire. And people, they 
Of the course, they, they, they wash the it fire, twice. They yes. think everything, every bad things can go to fire, and the flame is the energy. Yes. Come back to you. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, let me let me let me point out that um, Islam is not taking anybody's place, or Islam is just a continuous to one message that was since the beginning of of Earth. So I believe that, and I've been like uh, re um, how do you illustrating this as it was one river. It's a one flowing river. And every tribe, every nation has has their own narrative about this flowing river. So I believe that we might have a lot in common, a lot to share than to d uh, and to agree on rather than to disagree. This is why we've made people and tribes to get to know I one another. So we think the conversation could be more interesting. If, I, if you and me would agree on a certain thing, then it's, it's, life would be boring, isn't it? <laughs> but at least we wouldn't have wars. But like, that, I mean, but on on a, on a very like human, uh, communal level, it is beautiful to have these differences. And what what you see, what you what you're saying is just so beautiful. Yeah. So I think that's actually the perfect place to end on. Uh, so thank you so much to Ahmed. You're Nabil most welcome. Thank you so much, everybody. For attending.